uh, welcome everyone uh, for this uh, uh, edition of uh, webinar on WS2 Digital Assets Governance. Uh, um, so today uh, we'll be focusing about uh, WS2 Digital Assets Governance and uh, what it can be used for. And uh, we'll also be uh, kind of uh, showing you uh, some working examples uh, like uh, how to create assets and uh, other things around governance uh, related to assets uh, will be covered today. Uh, my name is Shazni. Uh, I'm a senior lead solutions engineer uh, uh, in the solutions architecture team of WSO2. Uh, so welcome everyone. So uh, I would like to start uh, uh, with a little bit of a, a detail about WSO2's uh, platform, uh, which we call as uh, uh, WSO2's API-led integration platform. Uh, as you may already know that uh, WSO2 has uh, uh, three uh, main uh, products in its portfolio, uh, which are the API manager, WSO2 API manager, uh, uh, that can be used for management of APIs, uh, uh, things like, uh, you know, doing API security, uh, throttling, uh, rate limiting, and things like that. And, uh, and you also know that uh, WSO2 also has a product named WSO2 Enterprise Integrator, uh, which is a kind of an ESB solution which can be used to integrate different uh, systems uh, from data sources and then do uh, typical kind of service orchestration transformation and things like that. And uh, typically that goes uh, hand in hand with API Manager where Enterprise Integrator can expose APIs and proxy services and things like that. And the API manager will usually front those uh, services uh, to be exposed uh, for various other uh, entities, uh, also for the internet, uh, for example. And uh, uh, identity server is the other product, uh, which, uh, uh, which it, as its name implies, uh, uh, is used for identity and access management uh, kind of uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, you can use that for uh, single sign-on uh, kind of functionality for your uh, web applications and mobile applications and it can do more uh, on, on things like access control and privacy control uh, and uh, uh, to achieve a multi-factor authentication uh, for your uh, applications and so forth. So these are the primary uh, products that uh, WS2 has in its portfolio. So uh, these are the horizontal solutions. Apart from that, uh, WS2 also has uh, a number of uh, vertical solutions and uh, uh, some of these vertical solutions make use of uh, the three main uh, products, uh, the API Manager, Enterprise Integrator, Identity Server. Uh, for example, WS2 Open Banking Solution uh, is a tailor-made solution for uh, open banking requirements, uh, specifically uh, in those regions where there is a uh, banking specification, uh, such as the PSD2 in uh, 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 Europe, uh, for example. Uh, so that make use of uh, the the API manager, enterprise integrator, and the identity server. And uh, recently, WS2 also launched uh, this healthcare solution, which also makes use of the API manager, enterprise integrator, identity server to solve healthcare related uh, 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 typical uh, integration and API requirements. Uh, the digital access governance uh, is also a solution, uh, but, uh, you know, as opposed to open banking solution, the healthcare solution, it doesn't uh, make use of the API manager or the other two products. Uh, it's a standalone solution and it's an independent uh, separate solution uh, that can be used for assets governance. So uh, that says what it is, but let's also dive into the fact of what these digital assets mean and why do we need that uh, to be governed and uh, so that is the uh, main objective of this particular webinar to understand that fact and see how WS2 digital assets governance can uh, solve that problem so let's first understand about uh, uh, why govern digital assets so that's the the main uh, question uh, uh, main question of the hour actually so so let's uh, start by understanding what is digital assets uh, in the first place. So today uh, we know enterprises are 
continuously doing uh, digital transformation. So when, when I mean uh, digital transformation, it's about making everything digital and uh, basically exposing uh, the enterprise data in a meaningful, useful ways uh, to consumers of the enterprise, the customers of the enterprise and the partners of that enterprise to make use of that data to solve some business problem. So this entire process is what we call as the digital transformation. And it is not a one-off, one-time task. It's a continuous task. So enterprises have to uh, keep innovating and uh, do innovation on digital transformation uh, over and over and over again uh, to make, uh, you know, to be ahead of the game, uh, ahead of the competition, uh, of their particular domain. So racing to be innovative to serve customers better uh, is a norm today. It's not an exception, it's a norm today. So how can they achieve this? So enterprises uh, achieve this by doing real tangible work in their respective organizations. So there is a lot of uh, work that goes in enterprises uh, to bring this digital transformation to life, right? So there are multiple teams, uh, maybe business units working in parallel on different solutions and different technological, uh, you know, objectives, vision, missions, and so forth. And so this particular process of innovation creates a certain things uh, which we can call as assets uh, to make this digital transformation a reality. So things like uh, making your data exposed to other entities to utilize, you may create uh, interfaces, uh, which we call as application programming uh, interfaces or simply APIs. So then that API becomes an asset uh, to, uh, to tell in a different way that API is actually a digital asset rather than a just a tangible uh, sort of an asset. It's a digital asset where uh, it can bring value to your enterprise uh, in, in different uh, forms. And uh, you can expose those APIs and make revenue out of it. Or you can expose those APIs and create a mobile application that can drive business uh, to the enterprise and so forth. So APIs are just one example. Uh, for digital assets, but there can be more uh, things like SOAP services and any other thing that goes in your digital transformation uh, work that you really put into uh, uh, in, in your development teams and so forth, what comes out of that are what we call as digital assets. It could even be database schemas or event schemas, for example, or policies that you have in uh, uh, in your development processes. So all of these are digital assets that drive digital transformation. So when there are multiple teams and multiple business units working parallelly, uh, over time, these digital assets can grow in number. So you can have, uh, you can start with like five digital assets and then it will eventually grow up to 20 and then go up, goes up 50 and so forth it can uh, you know, easily uh, be in thousands in numbers, right? So when such a thing happens, it's easy to lose track of what is already there in the enterprise and uh, what you have already done in terms of APIs or other kinds of uh, assets. And uh, it can easily result in duplication of work or lose efficiency uh, in terms of reusing what you already have. So it's just one example of what that problem could be. So this entire problem, a class of problem, is what we call the technical debt. So the technical debt is a result of having no governance uh, in your enterprises, uh, especially when you have large number of assets. So this is the uh, this is one of the problem uh, statements that we wanted to highlight today, and digital assets governance need is to solve one of that problem, which is the technical debt, to minimize technical debt. And obviously you cannot make that technical debt uh, into, uh, you know, you cannot make it zero, but you can minimize it. 
and minimizing the technical debt also means that you save a lot of time and money right and uh, so having a proper governance solution to uh, keep track of what you already have and then do things around that is an investment on your side and but that brings back uh, you know return in terms of saving time and money so that's uh, basically uh, increases your return on investment of a, a governance solution like the WC governance, it's digital assets governance solution, which I'll show in a while. And uh, the need for digital assets governance uh, can also be uh, to be the center of excellence for your digital assets. So basically, it can give you a unified view of your assets scattered across your teams and uh, within your you know teams, you might be using different multi-vendor systems and uh, different assets like let's say APIs. APIs might reside uh, in API management kind of solutions, just like WS3 API management solutions. And your proxy services and whatnot, other, other types of uh, assets can reside in a uh, you know, system like an enterprise service. And so these different systems can vary, like it doesn't uh, necessarily have to be only API manager or enterprise, uh, integrate a kind of solution it can also be other types of solutions so even uh, uh, a messaging solution like kafka which can post events and streams and so how do you look at all these things in one place so that's what i mean by center of excellence and you have that if you can have that unified view of all those different types of assets in one place and that can be the governance solution or the digital assets governance solution for your asset catalog and so and and most of these digital assets don't just stand alone so they are uh, dependent on other solutions or other digital assets or possibly what we call as they have associations in between those so basically changing one of those digital assets also mean there is an impact so uh, you may be like if you are into development kind of thing uh, let's say you are changing a library or something and that may have an impact on your API. Eventually, that may also have an impact on your application end of the day. So changing a library means uh, you have to change your API, for example, right? And that also could mean uh, you might want to change your application and so forth. So how do you uh, analyze that uh, chain of things uh, that will be impacted by a change of one particular digital assets. So that is what we call as impact analysis. And if you can have that view of associations and dependencies in a place that will be vital to make uh, uh, you know, crucial decisions uh, based on uh, how, how this particular change should happen and what's the best way to do that. And also to define policies to streamline your asset life cycle. So things like uh, in your development uh, journey of your digital asset, you need to know exactly uh, whether proper policies have been followed. Uh, let's take an example of building an application. And, uh, you know, it, it's just uh, not, uh, the objective is not just to make that application into the market and you need to follow up with the right quality measures and also make sure that uh, it serves the intended purpose and it solves the problems. And uh, so then when it was decided by your, uh, enterprise in your company and uh, you put that into a proposal stage and then you go on to do development and then that also means you have to follow certain guidelines like you know following up with proper documentation for your application uh, usage uh, uh, documentation and also in, in development process you need to make sure the codes are reviewed properly and uh, test cases are committed and things like that. These are what we call as policies. So how do we ensure that policies are met and uh, so that your uh, you know, enterprise architects or you know, development managers can see uh, the status of your asset uh, basically in the life cycle where it stands. And so that is what we mean by uh, asset life cycle, a digital asset governance uh, solution is needed to uh, uh, look into that type of an information. So basically the metadata of uh, those uh, asset life cycle is important for making crucial decisions. And having all these assets cataloged in one place means you also need to search these assets quite fast. And uh, you know that can be facilitated uh, with 
uh, proper categorization and filtering as well and so uh, it's these are not just the advantages that you get out of the governance there are many more uh, uh, such as like notifying other uh, you know parties or relevant people when there is a change in your asset something like that so that can be another uh, use case for the governance so these are the types of things that you can solve with uh, a, a governance solution like wc2 digital assets governance solution right so this is a, a, a quick view of what i was talking about uh, uh, in the previous slide and just imagine there are two teams with various number of assets and there will be common set of assets and each team will have their own view of it and it doesn't mean like uh, one team it, this kind of a setup doesn't necessarily mean team a may exactly know what is there in team b and what have they built uh, already and can that be reused for example in, in their own applications and uh, different asset types for example so there has to be one common place or there, there should be a bird's eye view of all of these assets uh, underneath so that someone can easily make decisions saying okay team b has already built this thing i can make use of that and and you know it can save time uh, for me uh, and it also means it's go to market time for your application and other assets will be faster so so basically on top of all these things if you can have a solution that could govern and could have a unified view of your uh, enterprise assets that will be advantageous uh, for all the reasons that I mentioned up to now, right? So it can reduce the technical debt and it can uh, give a bird's eye view of your enterprise uh, assets in one place so that crucial decisions can be made and you can do impact analysis, uh, can find out the associations and other things and, and also can also uh, kind of use it as a place to get feedback uh, from whoever is using your digital assets as well. So we'll talk about those things when I show the uh, the solution uh, view in uh, uh, in a while. Uh, so moving on. So WS2 digital assets governance. So what is it and uh, how can you leverage that in your uh, enterprises? So this is a cloud-based solution. So you may know that WS2 API manager an enterprise integrator and IDN server, uh, you know, uh, we we are a cloud native uh, company and, uh, you know, API manager can be installed in on-premises in your data centers and can be uh, made uh, available in the cloud and can also make it work uh, in a hybrid kind of a uh, uh, situation as well, like uh, that kind of a deployment can be uh, made as well. Uh, but WS2 Digital Assets Governance is a tailor-made solution. Uh, in the cloud environment we are WS2 will be managing that entire environment uh, for you uh, like like for our customers WS2 will be managing this particular environment and will be providing the necessary access for the required portals like there is something called the publisher portal the developer uh, or rather the store portal and uh, and there is also an admin portal so those portal uh, accesses will be given for our customers but it will be a cloud based solution and uh, basically it will provide you the central catalog of your digital assets metadata when we say apis and proxy services and other types of digital assets be stored in the governance solution meaning uh, it will store the metadata of uh, those assets and it can bring the unified view as i mentioned and and having all this information in one place alone independently uh, is just not enough and you need to be able to bring uh, you know data from different systems to the asset governance solution in a pragmatic way in a programmatic way and so it can be uh, it can it should be able to be integrated with other multi-vendor solution. So the solution that we are kind of uh, 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 thinking of uh, with the governance solution is that uh, to use things like CICD platforms and make use of this popular uh, asset type called APIs uh, that are available for this particular solution and other solutions to integrate. So basically using some other multi-vendor systems, uh, available APIs or some other integration mechanisms to fetch details out of it 
and use the digital assets governance APIs to populate the digital assets uh, metadata and vice versa. So basically uh, that integration capability is also there. Basically the building blocks for that integration capability is there. And this asset solution is also extensible. Uh, it has some out of the box uh, assets like the APIs, the Swagger files, the Visdel files, uh, Visdel specification for soap services and things like that. Those are already available out of the box, but that is not uh, uh, end of it. Like you should also be able to create your own asset types as well, because a solution cannot have uh, all the assets that could ever be created in in a in a in an enterprise, right? So there can be uh, new types of assets uh, that may be needed uh, to be modeled, and uh, you know those metadata be tracked. So extensibility is a must and the asset governance solution as a mechanism or a data model, uh, what we call as RXT uh, to create that new asset type. And it's a cloud based solution, as I said, and then of course you can do analysis uh, such as impact analysis and, uh, and, and other types of reporting uh, related to assets as well uh, with this solution. So basically this governance solution can uh, interact, uh, it can provide the unified view and you can use the CI/CD kind of uh, mechanisms to integrate with different multi-vendor systems and bi-directional integration, as I said, uh, from asset governance solution to other multi-vendor systems and from other multi-vendor systems to onboard metadata to uh, uh, asset governance solution. So this is a DevOps, GitOps uh, ready mechanism. And also that means uh, using a CI/CD platform means it's a loosely connected uh, method, so it's not tightly coupled with the solution or the other multi-vendor systems. So basically what I was uh, 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 talking about is uh, a system like this. There will be this governance cloud solution. Uh, it's it's in the cloud and you might have a CI CD pipeline or other integration. It doesn't have to be CI CD kind of uh, a platform to onboard assets to governance solution or others other way. Let's say you have uh, API manager, an enterprise integrator, and a streaming integrator, and these will have different assets like APIs, GraphQL APIs, and uh, services and policies. And you want to bring those things to the governance assets, and these are in different systems. And you, uh, with this distributed uh, mechanism, you don't, this person don't see that in one place. It doesn't have that unified view. So you can use the CACD mechanisms to fetch details out of API manage and enterprise integrator and other types of solution. It doesn't have to be only these. It can be many other multi-vendor systems. Use the CICD platform to uh, do some integration, fetch those details and then make use of the REST API that is available in the governance cloud to populate the governance cloud. So that's the mechanism that we are kind of looking at. Okay, so we'll uh, talk uh, uh, about the key capabilities and in the meantime, like if you have any questions, uh, uh, use our questions tab to uh, ask your questions. I will make sure that I, I'll, I'll look at that and answer those questions properly or else we can take those questions at the end of the session as well. Uh, okay, so the key capabilities, uh, I already told about the, the, the business problem and why we need uh, such a solution. So the key capability of the WSO2 Digital Assets Governance Solution, there, there are three main portals, which is the publisher, store, and the administration portal. So those are comprehensive, easy to use portals. And if you're familiar with the WSO2 API Manager, uh, it, you, will, uh, uh, you will be a little familiar with this, uh, these portals as well. So it's similar to that. So the governance publisher, uh, instead of just uh, API metadata, you can add metadata of those assets that you have defined and the assets that are already available. You can create new versions of the assets. Uh, you can create associations and dependencies of those assets. And you can also manage asset life cycles in that publisher view. So I'll show that publisher view in a while. And also it contains a storefront, just like the WSV API Manager developer portal. It also has a storefront and where you can do uh, searching and you can do uh, categorizations, uh, like you can filter out uh, uh, assets based on categories that you have uh, defined and then you can also rate and comment 
uh, on your digital assets uh, for others to see. So that's uh, one of the things I told in the beginning of the presentation as well, uh, that this platform can also be used to get feedback uh, for your digital assets uh, uh, in the form of comments, for example. So there is also this admin portal where you can uh, create new asset definitions and also create your categories, uh, uh, for example, uh, to, to be categorized in, uh, in the storefront to, for easy searching and the filtering, right? So I also mentioned about that extensibility factor previously. And uh, so this extensibility is supported using uh, this solution or this uh, data model called the RXTs, which stands for Registry Extensions. And it is simply an XML configuration that defines the properties of your assets. And as I told, there are some out of the box assets. And uh, so when you create these uh, asset types, it will automatically create uh, the UI uh, to interact with uh, those assets and create those metadata automatically for you. So you don't have to create any UI uh, in terms of that. So asset life cycle, I also spoke about the life cycle uh, thing and why uh, we need the life cycles. So uh, the, the asset governance solution also provides a way for you to define custom life cycles for your assets. That is again an XML that defines the states and transition states uh, for your assets. And it can provide check boxes to validate state, state transitions. I told you previously in a development uh, process, you might want to make sure that uh, for your development asset uh, to move from development state to testing state, all test codes should be written, proper documentation should have been followed and all those things. So uh, this can be a place for you to make sure those things are in order. So. And also the life cycle uh, functionality provides a life cycle history. You need to know how things have changed uh, over the past uh, for that particular asset. Uh, when was it uh, moved from uh, development state to the testing state and so forth. And, and also you may also need to know about the different uh, levels of life cycle. So you can also attach multiple life cycles for a one particular asset. Right. So we'll talk about that uh, when, when I do the demonstration. And this is uh, a, a quick, you know, view of how the asset associations and dependencies will be viewed. Like if you if you can have a view like this to see, okay, these assets have these dependencies, how useful that will be uh, for your, uh, you know, that bird's eye view. So rather than going through uh, mundane documents or spreadsheets. Uh, you can have a graphical view like this and uh, you can easily make uh, a good insight uh, for your impact analysis right so i'll quickly uh, show you the assets and custom assets and life cycle things uh, in in the in the governance solution so uh, so this is the the publisher view of the the solution and uh, you can log into that it's somewhat similar to the the API manager, once you log in, you will see a number of assets and things uh, that you uh, like soap services, risk service, endpoints, schemas and policies. Uh, those assets can also be seen here as well. And you also see some other types of uh, different type of assets here. Uh, these are like uh, custom assets that I have added. I'll, I'll show how to do that one as well. So just quickly to show one thing here, uh, how quickly you can add a swagger into the the governance solution you can click this and then click swagger for example uh, which will take you to this view you can uh, import a swagger by a url or or, or you can uh, you can uh, also upload a swagger file if you already have one or you can also create something uh, on your own so i have uh, uh, a swagger already here which i wanted to like quickly fetch from here and it's a, it's a swagger file which I have uh, uh, prepared for this. And uh, let's say uh, I'll, I'll give it a name fund transfer API or fund confirmation and give a version number. And there is show editor. Uh, it will bring the swagger editor view for you. And then you can, of course, uh, put uh, the uh, YAML file which will automatically uh, create the swagger view on this site so you can look into those uh, details as well so you can uh, 
uh, you can work on this uh, uh, you know code view and that will automatically generate this uh, view as well for you to visualize that and then you can create that uh, so so this will create uh, your assets and there are a number of assets that I already had and so this will create the swagger uh, it will take a, a few seconds to create it here this will automatically create uh, the REST API associated with that as well. So account transaction API. So this is the one that I just created. And uh, going back, you will also see uh, fund confirmation. I just give that name to that. And it will show uh, some common uh, details uh, related to that. Um, and it will also show the the console view basically to see the, the the operations that you have for this and uh, like going into this uh, it will also show the the association between the swagger and the rest api that uh, got created uh, you know which i showed you uh, previously so this is uh, these are the the default assets that we have and then you can also search these assets and all those things you can do here and uh, and you can uh, define associations we'll talk about those things in a while i, I just want to like quickly show you uh, these assets and you can also create assets manually as well for example uh, creating a soap service manually means like you can give it a name namespace version description and other details and if you want to let's say capture something else uh, in this uh, not just namespaces but you may also want to maybe something called a schema ID or something like that uh, you can modify that and I'll, I'll show that how to do it and uh, so that is what uh, I meant by extensibility in the in the solution so you can do it here as well like you can add the uh, metadata here uh, the way that you define uh, is like uh, all these asset types that you see here uh, is defined in the admin uh, portal so basically I have this uh, which is the admin portal. Uh, you may be familiar with this uh, view uh, if you have worked with WS3 API Manager and other products. And once you go here uh, in the main view, you will see a, a few details related to where it is running and other details that is backed by, uh, you know, uh, the platform details where it is running and so forth. And if you go to this extension, you will see something called taxonomy artifact types life cycle and handlers let's go to the artifact types so these are the different asset types that i have these are the types of assets for example rest service is something that i showed you if you just go to here and you will see the model of that asset the name version and other details that you have captured now let's say i showed the soap services previously uh, and uh, that is probably this one and uh, I told you that we have name, namespaces, and if you want to capture something else, you will just add another field here in the model, and that's the additional property that you want to capture, and that will automatically create a new, uh, you know, text field or something related to that. And there are different types of uh, uh, building blocks that you can add. For example, these are text fields, this is a description field. You can also add a drop down, something like this, for example that is reflected here uh, in the contacts section for example as you can see this is an options text and you can have number of texts uh, you know uh, written down here and that will automatically get populated here and then it's just a matter of someone just creating these in uh, in this particular view so that's the custom asset thing and so now we understood about the the default assets and how you define custom assets and uh, you know, for example, I'll just quickly show you uh, in the uh, REST services. Let me go into one of this, uh, the one that I created. And there is this life cycle section. Uh, and, and as you can see, you can edit as well. For example, I can go here and maybe uh, create a quick uh, thing. I just put my name here. For example, I can add that value. Uh, you can edit that and that will be uh, available uh, in your view. You can delete it if you want to. You can create a new version of it, and and also this section for life cycle. So this life cycle, as you can see, there is a default life cycle already, and uh, there is a particular set of states uh, mentioned here. So I told you about certain checkboxes. We can click those things to make sure that 
port is completed, uh, quality of service things are done, uh, moving to testing stage. And I can promote it uh, saying now it is in this testing stage. We can also control who can move these things uh, between states as well. So basically you can assign permissions. So I have logged in as an admin so I, I uh, can do a promotion and demote here. But you can control like in your view in your portal like if someone else log in and if that person should not have permission to move uh, that can also be controlled. And that is controlled via this life cycle, for example. I'll, uh, so this life cycle section, I have this service life cycle. Uh, so this is where you have defined all these states, development state, testing state, production state. And in between those, uh, you can also control what are the check boxes that needs uh, to be uh, selected uh, for this to be moved to the next state. and while uh, you can also define permissions, for example, uh, who can uh, basically move this from production or, or, or from development state to the testing state and so forth. And also, uh, while you transfer the state from one state to the other, you can also make uh, sure that additional steps uh, be followed and you can plug a custom plugin or code, basically a Java code, uh, it's a class that you can plug in and then make sure that additional work happens and that particular class or the plugin gets fired uh, as, as the state gets transitioned. So that's very powerful, uh, that mechanism. So, and then this life cycle can be attached to a particular asset. For example, if you go to this REST service, you see uh, that is uh, uh, in, in the model that we have defined as a life cycle and give that the name. and once you have that thing that will automatically create a life cycle tab here and it will show this view automatically for you. So it's a powerful way of uh, uh, doing things. So if you want to, let's say, have another state in between, it should be uh, just a matter of modifying your life cycle state. So that's about it. So let's uh, quickly move on to the next section. So the, I also told you like once you have these assets, uh, uh, lined up, uh, we also need to have searching and categorizing capabilities. Search by asset name, version and content that should be useful and also searching by uh, tagging, like you can tag different assets and also hierarchical tree model which we call as taxonomy and uh, uh, that can help uh, filtering assets quite easily. So this is the taxonomy view uh, of how you add a particular asset to one of those hierarchies. Uh, you can define a taxonomy and attach that to an artifact and then when you add or edit an asset, you can assign that to various different categories. So let's quickly uh, go uh, do searching and tagging of these assets. So let's say I want to edit this and uh, let me quickly add a tag saying uh, commerce, for example. And you see this taxonomy view. I'll, I'll, show you how this came about here but let me just quickly assign this to um, corporate finance for example and i added that here and i added this commerce tag and i update it and so this value is updated and then you can go to the storefront and then let me quickly log into the storefront as well and then go to the uh, rest service section all the recently added uh, uh, assets will be shown there and you see this commerce tag here and so if once you click that it will bring back the, the the assets that you have assigned that tag with so that is easy filtering and so going back to the all the assets and also you can see these business units and so these because now this business unit taxonomy is attached to this rest service you can have all these categories now I assign the corporate finance thing right so let me just categorize that. Now see, once I select it, it will bring back the, the assets that you have categorized under that particular category or the taxonomy. Now how this business unit came about here uh, is, uh, that is also a task of this admin console. So you go to this taxonomy section. Uh, I have a number of taxonomies defined now, but I'm uh, interested in this business unit section. It's, a, it's a, yet another XML that defines the hierarchy. So there is a root level business unit and then there is a uh, corporate finance level under uh, you know this root level 
and then loan section and then under each of those nodes you can also have subcategories so that's what you can see here let me just go to edit view again and for example uh, select taxonomy some things have further levels if you see it's further levels and that those are subcategories and you can assign these for example if i just add this you can add it to another category as well so then you can assign there yeah. and then you can also easily uh, filter that so this is a powerful mechanism of easy searching and filtering right so going back to the presentation so the next section uh, so notifications as i said this can be another use case uh, of a governance solution when you want to make changes you may want to send someone an email saying this particular asset is changed so or, or you want to just get a console notification over here saying that uh, this particular asset has recently changed or we can also put that notification into a jmx uh, kind of a uh, solution as well or uh, you can uh, also send that notification via a SOAP or a REST interface like if that interface is already there we can post that uh, notification to that REST endpoint as well right and uh, yeah so the integration I told you about the integration aspect of things uh, and it is vital to have uh, uh, integration uh, for example as I told previously there might be a CI CD platform in between and then you might want to bring uh, let's say if you have an API manager and API is defined already there and how do we bring all these assets to the governance solution rather than manually creating those so governance solution has a rest API which can help do such integrations and of course those other systems uh, should also have uh, uh, you know some sort of an integration mechanism it doesn't need to be a rest api but if it can be a rest api that's going to be quite easy because then because the modern way of working is uh, rest apis and uh, related uh, technologies as well but if you if that other integration mechanism needs to be a java api or a soap service or something like that uh, that can also help anyhow uh, the, the bottom line is those other systems uh, like your other API managers or other uh, uh, enterprise service bus or other solution that we are talking about to integrate or bring uh, the data or sync those data with the governance should have some way of fetching those details and then governance solution provides a REST API to update things so whatever I showed you here the, the things that you like you can manually create your rest apis for example right and uh, so these rest apis can be manually created all this can be created using the rest api as well for example there is a solution level rest api so rather than uh, dealing with this particular ui you can make use of uh, uh, a rest api that is available for this solution to populate this i'll show that in a demonstration uh, while so let's uh, quickly do that demo now so uh, let's say i'm going to quickly show you the ws2 enterprise integrator now uh, in this case i'm using the ws2 enterprise integrator version 6.6 uh, but you know ws2 has a, a newer version of enterprise integrator which is uh, version 702 which is also which also which has the micro integrator underneath uh, and the streaming integrator but i'm for this demonstration purpose i'm going to use the enterprise integrator version 6.6 so what i want to do is now uh, in this uh, particular solution i have a number of proxy services so these are the proxy services that i have and these have visitors for example now these are visible files for these each of these proxy services you can look at these visible files right so now uh, in, in the governance solution, for example, I have these visitors, for example. I don't have any visitors added, but you can manually add these visitors, for example, or upload a visitor from a file so that you can have those visitors in one place. And uh, because you may have WS2 Enterprise Integrator or maybe another solution that has another SOAP service or something, and then you also want to fetch those visitors and, and put it in one place. And visitors also mean there is a corresponding SOAP service. And uh, for example, this SOAP service, I already have one created manually, but uh, you know, what if I want to create or 
fetch these things. These are basically proxy services or in other words, SOAP services that has a corresponding uh, visual file. So I want to bring all these visual files to my uh, uh, governance uh, solution. Right? So I, I'm just going to demonstrate the integration uh, capability here. And uh, you can either do things manually. For example, here there are about uh, how much? Like eight, for example, uh, you know, visual files and SOAP services here. You can manually create it here, but that's going to be tough if you have about, let's say, 50. That's going to be tough. So that's where the integration may help. So basically, I'm going to use a CI CD platform, which is Jenkins. And uh, then I have this particular type called the ESB Sync GAU. And if you look at uh, this particular configuration, uh, I already have written a, uh, what you call a, a, a syncing mechanism. So it is integration logic is built or baked into this particular uh, Java implementation, which makes use of uh, the APIs that are available in the enterprise integrator to fetch these details and uh, use the the governance solutions REST APIs to auto populate that. So basically this uh, enterprise integrator or, or the, the, the Jenkins doesn't do anything special. Basically it passes a number of attributes to this particular uh, solution uh, or the or the or the integration mechanism and then automatically create this so i'm going to just run this and you will see uh the visitors appear here automatically all these visitors that you see here will appear here automatically so let's try to run this and build it so this is just a, a mechanism for to show i'm just going to quickly see what's happening in my console so that don't worry about this this is just a uh text or the log that i have put in the in, in my implementation and it's all successful so now you see this here you didn't see anything here now i'm going to refresh automatically this has brought in version uh you know for example calculator uh, that you find so that's the integration mechanism. So let me quickly also show you uh, how to bring the APIs. Now this is the latest API manager that uh, we have in WSU2, uh, WSU API manager version 3.2. I already have one sample API created called the Flask API. And I automatically want to bring this API and the related Swagger file. I'm to look, uh, load into this, uh, uh, yeah. So this has a swagger file, uh, which you can see here. This swagger file, I want to bring it to my uh, governance solution. I don't have something called Flask here. Let me quickly search for that. Uh, I don't have anything called Flask, uh, but let's see uh, if I can do something here. So again, I'm going to use my CI CD platform. So uh, this should tell you like uh, it doesn't have to be a ci cd uh, in, in the esb sync case i had a java code written and you can execute that java code uh, uh, separately independently as well it doesn't have to be through a ci cd platform but i just made use of it to facilitate my uh, integration so if i just go back to my jobs i have something called uh, api sync governance uh, if you look at this uh, basically I have uh, a different mechanism used. I have written a Python code here, which basically talks to our uh, API manager, this one, fetch the APIs, all the APIs that uh, basically fetches all the APIs here, but apparently I only have one API in my API manager. And then I use the governance uh, uh, you know, API to populate uh, this. So this is just a very simple, uh, Python script uh, just to tell you that it can be anything it can be Python or it can be a Java code or it can be any other uh, Integration mechanism you can even use WS enterprise integrator to uh, do this for example So let me just quickly run this as well and show if things are working fine um, Yeah just uh, Uh, did it complete actually it, uh, it completed uh, so fast I didn't notice that uh, okay let's see uh, in here 
and we have this flask api automatically created and can you see that and uh, just going back to the rest uh, uh, section you will also see a corresponding api creator so it just went uh, quite fast uh, and uh, you know if you could just look at this it also has uh, uh, you know the details i have just logged in that python script so this is a, a, a very uh, you know basic demonstration of what kind of things you can do uh, with uh, with this particular solution so just i demonstrated the asset onboarding things from different other systems and if you have other kind of solutions you can do such integration as well so uh, to wind up everything uh, to talk about talk a little bit about the commercial offering as i told you uh, at the beginning so digital assets governance uh, w3 digital asset governance solution is on the cloud and it's offered as a private service uh, for our customers with a dedicated data store and it's not a uh, you know shared platform uh, like normal saas applications it's not a shared platform it will be a dedicated uh, offering and when our prospects uh, would like to uh, you know uh, partner with us for this particular solution then ws2 will, will will post that for them and uh, which can take a few days to uh, you know build that up but it will be a dedicated uh, a deployment for uh, you and there will be a fixed annual subscription fee for this and uh, you know once you are interested uh, you can get those details from our account managers and uh, we are also thinking of to uh, provide a one month of consultancy service uh, for this particular solution once everything is subscribed and also there can be other uh, add-ons like VPN for example if you want to because this will be in the cloud and you might want to uh, you know fetch details from your on-premises uh, details from the uh, governance solution then we might need a VPN uh, or direct connection uh, uh, for that so that kind of add-ons uh, can also be provided and additional uh, consultancy services can also be uh, provided or you can also uh, leverage uh, services from uh, WSO2 uh, partners as well. Uh, so yeah, so those are the commercial things uh, that I wanted to touch upon uh, very quickly. So uh, I would like to invite you to uh, visit uh, WSO2.com uh, slash digital assets governance uh, uh, URL uh, uh, for you to uh, uh like see more details about it and then also like if you are interested uh, we can we can touch this and uh, yeah so that's all i have got for today and i hope you you uh, got something out of this uh, uh webinar and uh, i would like to uh, now stop for any questions like if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer yeah Uh, yeah, so we have about another four minutes, so I'll, I'll wait a couple of minutes to see if, if others have any questions. Uh, if not, you can also uh, reach out to us uh, from our contact us form in uh, this website, and we will also be able to answer you uh, promptly there as well. Uh, no questions up to now. Uh, yeah, we can wait a couple of minutes more. Uh, all right, so uh, uh, looks like we don't have uh, any questions. Uh, uh, so uh, thanks everyone for joining today and uh, uh, we hope that you uh, uh, took something out of this particular webinar and uh, if you're interested, uh, let us know as well. And uh, you can also reach out to us uh, via WC2 uh, website contact us form. Uh, thanks a lot and we'll meet you in another webinar then. Thank you.